So first of all, uh, good evening, sir. And to begin with, we'll give a brief introduction about the speaker for today. We have with us uh, Tony Joseph, sir, who happens to be an Indian journalist for approximately three decades, and of course, a former editor of uh, Business World magazine. And he's also chaired and co-founded the Mind Works Global Media Services, which happens to be one of a good forum, which we could actually read a lot of things upon. He's a regular contributor uh, to the Outlook India, Live Mint, The Hindu, and many other news forums by and large. And one thing which we are very proud today and which we'll be discussing in length is about the book that he's authored. And the book is called The Early Indians, The Story of Our Ancestors and Where They Come From. So this book to begin with, And to start with is something which I personally had a glance over, read page by page. It's a 300-page book, which uh, my student shall issue advice. And while having a look and while perusing the book, one thing for sure that is committed throughout this book, throughout this literature, through this novel literature, is the fact that we've been viewing a lot of uh, dialogues on population democracies, how uh, different uh, populations have evolved and how well framed they are. But all of this comes from a, let's say, quasi-religious ideological lens. But this book seems to have a stand which is free from a religious stand by and large. And on a very progressive note, the fact being that it has and speaks of six disciplines which is an amazing thing to put forward at the first uh, note. It has a lot of literature that has been um, uh, gathered from, that has been uh, s- gathered from sources that are more than reliable. And to safely say they are more than uh, well uh, prudential uh, sources. So we have uh, history, we have archaeology, we have linguistics, we have population genetics, we have philology, we have epigraphy, a blend of all this beautifully articulated by Tony Joseph, sir. And this book speaks of something which I think in the times to come would be an epoch making event as far as both the political and the historical dialogues as far as, a, as the migration studies or population of any country is considered. So not taking much of a time, I think we can begin the session by posing one of the most important questions that would come up to our minds and would actually bring us to the uh, breaking of the ice at this moment would be the fact that six disciplines and factual foundations all backloaded in this book. So so what actually made you, uh, what provoked you to write write this book first at the first time? Yes, sir. Thank you, Rabina. When I started on this book, the idea was not, uh, I was not trying to answer the question who we are. I was merely trying to answer a question that had been on my mind for a very long time, which is who were the Harappans and where did they disappear? Because uh, I was always fascinated by the Harappan civilization. And uh, there were three questions that were never fully answered, even when we read about it in school. Who were they? Where did they disappear? And most importantly, why did it take more than a thousand years after their civilization declined for the next cities to rise up in India? We had to wait almost till the uh, Mauryas arrived for the next, uh, uh, for us to see the next really ambitious uh, building structures and cities. So that's where I started. And uh, I would, uh, I thought I would look at what has been found in recent years across disciplines uh, and see how far we can answer those questions. So I went to all the Harappan sites I could go to, including Tholavira in Gujarat, uh, Lothar again in Gujarat, Rakhigadi in Haryana. And I would follow that visits up with uh, meetings and conversations with archaeologists, epigraphists, linguists who had all worked on those sites. Uh, or on the Harappan civilization. And uh, so these were really good conversations that gave me a lot more information. But 
did not, uh, but but also raised new questions. Then you realize that you can't really answer the question of who were the Harappans unless you figured out who were the first uh, farmers, because the Harappan civilization grew naturally out of the agricultural revolution that started happening in northwestern India around uh, 9,000 years ago. So you, so you had to figure out who were the first farmers. Then by and by, the scope of the project just expanded and uh, finally became uh, who, were, who were the, who are us, who, who were our ancestors, how, how did the Indian population to form. In this process, uh, I also stumbled upon what was uh, a relatively new uh, area, which is population genetics. And it just so happened that in the last five years, population genetics has been making dramatic improvements in understanding human prehistory, not just across the world, not just in South Asia. South Asia is just one of the areas uh, that it has thrown light on. But today we have far more clearer understanding of human prehistory, whether it is in the Americas, in Europe, in Asia, in the rest of Asia, across the world. This is because population geneticists today can extract uh, DNA from people who lived thousands or tens of thousands of years ago and then analyze it to understand how they connect to what people today. So they have recovered ancient DNA of, pe of people who lived thousands and tens of thousands of years ago, hundreds and hundreds of samples across the world. So that's what has given much greater clarity into the, into the formation of uh, human populations across the world. And uh, the amazing thing is that these new insights, they gel well with the existing understandings from other disciplines, such as archaeology, linguistics, geography, and, and so on, biology. So since I started my project, you know, the population genetics was the last discipline to be added. To my research, because I started with archaeology and other, other other disciplines that were to looking at the question of uh, human population formation. So it just so happened that I was, you could say that I was at the right place at the right time. And that's how it happened. Taking from there, uh, I would also like to add one thing to what yeah. you've actually put forward. So we've entered into an era of interdisciplinary studies. So we are appreciating a lot of uh, interdisciplinary literature. So there was, there was, there used to be a time, I guess, ten years back down the line, because I happened to be an alumni of Aligarh Muslim University and University of Madras, which are yeah. known for history departments and archaeology departments. So I used to see people going through those brown papers and looking them into a big, big classes and producing literature which had volume but had no uh, substantial backing in the contemporary times. So I think this book actually addresses to that. And it appreciates interdisciplinary research. So it is also one of a kind of a literature which I think people from different fields can appreciate. So, of course, that's one point how we can look at it. Now, going forward, I have another question as far as the book is considered. The fact being that you've broken down the book in phase-wise uh, developments. So we have the early Indians, which trace back to approximately, let's say, 65,000 uh, 65, years back. And then you have a second wave of migration, which we would call people from the Iran or people from Zargos. And then you have the third wave and then the fourth wave, that is the Aryans. And then you have the other development that goes on. So if we were to decipher, let's say, phase by phase and without uh, entering into the, uh, let's say, political or contemporary de debate, I would like you to throw some light on the fact that who were actually the first Indians, as you call them, the first Indians within court. And what was this first wave of migration that took place? Please, sir. Yeah, uh, my book actually talks about migrations that shaped uh, the Indian uh, population. But I think it would help us if we were to understand this in a global context. And if you look at it in a global context, we know today, based on the findings, recent findings of ancient DNA as well, is that uh, there are four classes of migrations that formed all global populations. Because you might, we might ask, there are migrations that happen all the time across time and space. 
And so how do we put any structure to it? The way to put a structure to it is to realize that uh, these four classes of migrations are substantially responsible for the way that uh, different population groups in different parts of the world are. So what are these four classes of migrations? The first class of migrations are the out of Africa migrations, which you might have heard about or read about. This happened around 70,000 years ago when a group of Africans moved out of Africa into the Arabian Peninsula and then went on to populate all of the rest of the world. Each of these four classes of migrations, as we will see, were driven by global factors. And that's why in the sense that when we look back, we can see why those happened when they happened. The, the, the out of Africa migrations, for example, like every other migration of other mammals, for example, happened because of climate factors. These were determined by when the glacial ages ended or when they began, when, when different areas became habitable, etc. So this out of Africa migrations that happened out of Africa into the Arabian Peninsula around 70,000 years ago. And then over the next few thousands of years, they moved all across the world. The last continent that they reached was the Americas, which uh, until recently we believed that they reached in the Americas around 16,000 years ago. But very recent findings uh, suggest that they might have reached there even around uh, 30,000 years ago. So this is the period when they expanded all over the world. So the question is, so this is the first class of nations that put modern humans in every part of the world. Uh, when did they reach in based on the findings of the fossils behind by modern humans in various parts of the world, we can say that they were in India by around 65,000 years ago. So the first modern human or Homo sapiens were in India only by around 65,000 years ago. They did not come into a empty land, of course, because when they arrived here, there were other Homo species who were already here, who have been here for about 1.5 million years. But uh, they went extinct over a period of time. So this is the, all of us are descendants in some ways of those people who came 65,000 years ago. This is the first class of migrations, uh, the out of Africa migration. So if you ask who were the first Indians, who were the first uh, Japanese, who were the first Australians, who were the first Americans, the answer to that, all of those questions is just the same. They are all out of Africa migrants who reached these different places around the world at different times. Now, as they were spreading around the world, a major event happened, which is there is a glacial uh, age that uh, intervened between about uh, 29,000 years ago and about uh, 14,000 years ago, which meant that these expanding population groups got separated from each other because large parts of the world became uninhabitable and uh, different population groups in different parts of the world started developing minor genetic differences. Even today, 99.9% of uh, the DNA of modern humans everywhere in the world are just the same. So the difference is really marginal in the larger scheme of things. So now when the glacial age ended, what we then see are different population groups in different parts of the world experimenting with agriculture. Not all of them were successful. Not all successful experiments were uh, sustainable. And because we can see, for example, the one of the earliest experiments in agriculture happened in East Asia, where people were uh, cultivating yams, bananas, tubers, but uh, these were not very productive crops. So that did not lead on to major lifestyle changes. But in some areas of the world where people were lucky enough, where they had, uh, where they could domesticate uh, cereals such as uh, wheat, rice, barley, they were very lucky because these crops had were highly productive over time, and which meant that these uh, these people, these populations, could actually change their lifestyle. They could become farmers or settled farmers from uh, hunter gatherers, uh, like everyone before them were. These were the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Indians, and the Chinese. So these are the areas where agriculture took off in a major way. And uh, the result of agriculture taking off in a major way are population explosion because farmer groups, the, the population of farmers grow at a much faster rate than that of hunter-gatherers. 
So you see in each of these areas where uh, agri agriculture began, we see huge population expansions and the result of that are migrations. So this is the second class of migrations that shaped world demography or every part of the world. So and these are agriculture related and the driving force behind them is human mastery over agriculture and the resulting population explosion that changed the demography across the world. The third class of migrations uh, happened when a, when some uh, when a particular modern human population group in Central Asia figured out how to ride a horse and combine that with master mastery of metallurgy. Uh, then you can imagine that this is the first time that modern humans are acquiring the kind of mobility that they did. And the result was dramatic. These groups moved into uh, Europe, first of all, which were already populated and significantly changed their uh, demography. They, so these, this group, this particular group from Central Asia, uh, they changed the demography of Europe Central Asia itself, which is a very large 8,000 kilometers across in, in, in the West Asia, South Asia, all, and, and even all the way up to China. So this is the third class of migrations, and the driving force is mastery of a, of a horse. And the last fourth class of migration is something that happened in, in uh, historical times. And we have all been, or our parents have born, uh, and have felt the impact of it which are colonial migrations, which happened because some uh, modern human population groups figured out how to travel large distances over the seas, invented the steamships, which allowed them to go into, again, areas that were already populated and dominate them. And they changed the demography of, uh, of the Americas, of Australia, and many other parts of the world. So these are the four classes of migrations that shaped almost all of the world's demography. There are other migrations also that happened. This is not an ex exclusive other uh, mig list of migrations, but these are the four classes of migrations that affected or shaped population groups all over the world in different ways. Now, you have to ask the question, how did these four classes of migrations affect us in India? The, answer, the first answer is that we have to first discount the last class of migrations, the colonial migrations, because they did not leave a large mark on our demography, because the number of people who came as migrants during the colonial uh, period were too few related to the, in, in comparison with the already existing population. So they left very little mark on, our, on the Indian demography. So if you have to understand how the Indian population formed, then you have to figure out how the other three classes of migrations affected us. The first one we already learned there were the, the out of Africa migrations that happened that, that arrived in India around 65,000 years. The second class of uh, migrations that shaped Indian population happened as a result, result of uh, agriculture taking off in northwestern India or a very large part. So we know from archaeology that started happening around 9,000 years ago in northwestern India. Who was that population? Uh, what was the population that was uh, that was driving this agricultural expansion in northwestern India? We now know from genetic res uh, research, population genetics, that this was a mixed population of first Indians, that is Indians who were here around 65,000 years ago, the out of Africa migrants, which my book calls the first Indians. So it's a mixture of the first Indians and another population group related to Iranian agriculturists who have been here before uh, around 12,000 uh, years ago or so. So it is a mixed population of, uh, of first Indians and a population related to Iranian agriculturists that created the agricultural revolution in northwestern India, which then became the Harappan civilization over almost uh, 4,000 to 5,000 years. The Machua Harappan, it developed into the Machua Harappan part period of the Harappan civilization around 2600 BCE. The, the Harappan civilization in its mature period lasted about, seven, about 700 years between 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE. So this is the second, when the civilization declined, started uh, declining around 1900 BCE because of a long drought that affected many civilizations at the same time. 
uh, these people, the Harappans, this mixed population, started moving out. They moved out all across uh, the rest of the subcontinent, so uh, spreading their culture and their uh, genetic heritage. So you can today say that the Harappans thus became the ancestors of all Indians. Now, all of the rest of the population were the subcontinent was already populated by the first Indians and then the agricultural revolution began with this new mixed population which also spread on the rest of the world when the civilization declined. But this was not the only agricultural related migration that happened. There is also a, uh, uh, another agriculture related migration that happened from eastern India or from East Asia. That happened around uh, 2000 BC or a little later. Uh, this was a result of China taking to agriculture and huge migrations that happened that came all the way. They, they, that, that changed the demography of East Asia and it came all the way and the tail end of that reached India. And they spread, uh, they brought a new language with them, which is called Austroasiatic. And we can today see that, that language being spoken by tribals in Central India and Eastern India, Austroasiatic languages such as Khasi and Mundari which we know are related to languages today spoken in, in Vietnam, in Laos, and so on, or, or family of languages that are called Mon Khmer languages in, in uh, Eastern Asia. So these are, the, these are three migrations. That leaves the very last migration, which happened, we now know, between 2000 BCE and 1500 BCE. This is from genetic research, which brought the pastoralists, the horse riding, uh, pastoralists from Central Asia uh, who reached India between this period, between 2000 and 1500 BC. These are people, this is a population that have already moved into Europe uh, around 1000 years earlier, that's around 2000 BCE. And uh, between this period, they moved down to an affected population in, in, in South Asia as well. And this is the migration, the Central Asian pastoralists who moved across Central Asia into Europe and into South Asia and all the way up to China. This is the group that spread, we now know today, Indo-European languages. Indo-European languages are today spoken by three-fourths of the Indian population. They are spread all over the world. It's the largest uh, family of languages spoken by people around the world. And the easternmost limit of this language spread is India, or to be more accurate, is Bangladesh, which is part of the Indian subcontinent. To the east of uh, Bangladesh, you will not find any group speaking in Indo-European language. And towards the west, it goes all the way up to Iceland. So you are talking about most of the North Indian languages from Hindi, Gujarati, Bengali, uh, or all of that, to uh, Iranian languages, Persian language. You are talking about um, Germanic languages. Greek, English, French, almost all of the Western European languages with the exception of one language called Basque. So this is the spread of Indo-European languages. And now we know that this is the migration of Central Asian pastoralists that spread uh, these languages around the world that, that the way that they are. So if you today when you look at the Indian population, they are the result of these four migrations, the earliest out of Africa migrations, then the West Asian migrations at the population related to Iranian farmers, which caused, which uh, uh, mixed with the first Indians and caused the agricultural revolution and then the Harappan civilization. The East Asians who arrived around 4,000 years ago and the Central Asians who arrived between 4,000 to 3,500 years ago. And today this is the combination. These are the main components of the Indian population. And today you will see no matter where in the caste hierarchy you are, no matter which language region you inhabit, no matter what language you speak, no matter what religion you are, this is, these are the four components of the Indian population you will find in different proportions. In Eastern India, you will find more of the East Asian ancestry. Uh, in Northern India, you will find more of the West Asian or Central Asian ancestry. In uh, South India, you will find more of the First Indian ancestry. But all population groups are mixtures. Uh, there are no population groups in India today that are not a mixture. And uh, in fact, the striking fact is that no matter which population group that you take in any part of the country, of the subcontinent, not just, not just, not just the Republic of India, 
but uh, all of South Asia. Any population that you you would take, you are likely to find 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of that population group will come from the first Indians. That's Indians. That's the people who came here 65,000 years ago. That's a striking figure. We did not know this early. For example, in Europe today, if you look at the European population, you will find the ancestry of the first hunter gatherers of Europe is in the single digits, except in Northern Europe, which it is somewhat higher. But we have the, the ancestry of the first Indians in the Indian subcontinent is significantly, significantly higher. So this goes against many of the assumptions that the rest of the population so far had. For example, they used to think that the uh, the, the, the tribals are somehow very different from the rest of the population. What we now know is that the rest of the population has no closer relative in a genetic sense than the tribals. And uh, anywhere in the world, the closest relatives for the rest of the population are the Indian tribal. Oh, but all population groups are mixtures. So um, that's yes. how you... Yeah. Taking from, yes, taking from where you said, sir... Uh, so we, we, we've been seeing in the recent times, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, reclamation of history going on, be it by yeah. the uh, left wing people or the right wing people. So there is this idea of reclaiming the history from a perspective which uh, actually uh, backs up their ideological uh, thinking or ideological lines of thinking. So uh, this brings up to a point that, of course, yes, early Indians Early Indians actually talks about the idea which is backed by scientific analogy. And of course, you've you've drawn a very beautiful line where we see how we've grown from being hunters and then going to the, uh, let's say, agriculture-induced migration to going to a phase where we developed into uh, tool-making and metallurgy and a lot of uh, uh, skills that helped us, you know, that helped us in mobility. And of course, and then we move to a later stage where you come up with the fourth wave of migration. Interestingly, you've also come up with the idea of pizza, comparing this whole concept with pizza. So you've you've compared uh, the base as being the first wave of migration being the Africans. And then you have the cheese that is the harapan because it solidifies with the base. And then you have the sauce because then the sauce would include the people who've been mobile. And these would include people from, let's say, a lot of people who've been uh, practicing a lot of uh, tool making techniques. And then you have the mushroom or the typical topping. So usually in the contemporary times, what we're seeing is people are missing on the base, the sauce and the cheese. And what they're doing is uh, what the cherry picking is all about is regarding the mushroom or let's say the toppings, which are at the topmost layer. So people are actually yeah. not interested into looking or, uh, let's say, rereading the things which are factually yeah. placed, but they're actually interested in cherry picking. So this has led to a lot of debates in the contemporary times. And of course, we see that if we come up and if we move from a lot of history and archaeology in the contemporary times, we would see that at some point of time, as rightly said by you, that we all are migrants. But then this idea of pure theory of race propounds very... Um, let's say, time and again in the normal political ideologue. And then you have the idea of Swayam Bhu. So how far do you think or what is your idea? Or what's your take regarding the pure race theory or Swayam Bhu theory, which is prevalent in the current times as far as the political ideologies are considered? Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two or three things have become now clear that uh, many earlier ideas have now to be completely thrown out because they're no longer... We now we know that they no longer bear any relationship with uh, reality. The idea of race no longer holds. It's not a phrase that is used in. And I don't think in, in modern terms it's a it's even a word that would be that would be used because all population groups. There's no pure race that exists in the world today. Not in India. Not in no, not elsewhere. All population groups are mixtures. And they are mixtures caused by significant migrations that happened in the past. And so all population groups are mixtures of ancient groups. And those ancient groups are again mixtures of earlier ancient groups. So the idea of purity of race has no meaning. Even if you were to find, if you were at all to find a pure race, if I were to engage in a hypothetical exercise, then it would be a group that is so remote from everywhere else that it hasn't had any interaction with the rest of the humanity for thousands and thousands of years. Maybe the Sentinelis. We haven't got a DNA of the Sentinelis, uh, but it's possible. But I think those will be extreme exceptions. 
most of the, the for the most of the uh, for almost all of the rest of the modern human population groups purity of race and race itself is a concept that makes no no sense but i i, I had used the concept of the pizza to say because i this is this is something that came as a surprise to me as i was doing the research it was a surprise that 50 to 65% of our ancestry comes from the people who came here 65000 years ago and that is the perspective of what caste you are uh, what language you speak what region you inhabit that's the base that's the base of the pizza the pizza doesn't exist without that base that's the that's the basic existence of the pizza the second thing is that this ancestry is limited to south asia you will not find this anywhere else so the pizza is very unique because its base is is restricted to south asia you would see it in india of course and all the other south asian countries the sauce i what what i had uh, used is the harappan civilization because when the harappan civilization declined they moved all across the world taking their genetic ancestry as well as their culture around and uh, many of the uh, cultural uniformities that we see in india today can be traced back to the the things that they did or things that were made in the harappan civilization which we can see from the from the way cooking utensils were made from some of the images that we can see on uh, on the uh, you know there are images that suggest that the people tree was very sacred which we now know that, that, that even now today it is so there are many things that hold us together the way houses were built around courtyards uh, so there are many things that hold us together to the harappan civilization and the harappan civilization was the largest civilization of its time as big as the mesopotamian and and the egyptian civilizations put together in both in terms of area and in population and remember that the uh, the harappan civilization existed before the central asian indo european language speaking people who called themselves arya arrived and uh, therefore the language that they spoke my book argues based on facts that uh, was likely to have been a proto dravidian language and they would have uh, spread that language also to south india to north india but with the next migration that happened uh, from central asia in northern india the language got displaced and the proto dravidian uh, languages got displaced by the new language of uh, of, of the indo european language speaking people who arrived while their language continued to thrive in southern india and develop into the all of the four or all of the major south indian languages so that's the source that's a source that spread over the base i called the central asian uh, pastoralists who called themselves aitya and who moved in as the cheese is not spread uniformly there's more of it in the north than uh, less of it in the south but it is spread all over and the austro asiatics are also uh, and of course then there are many other migrations that happened whether we are talking about the huns the sakhas the arabs the Mok- the there's a whole range of people who came at various points of time but the migrations that left a genetic mark are essentially the four that we talked about all the other migrations that happened after the arrival of the central asian pastoralists uh, whether it is the the sarkas the huns all of all of them the arabs the persians the british all of the migrations that and invasions that happened later left very little mark on our uh, genetic uh, demography uh, though some of them may have left a large mark on our culture so this is what we are today and uh, one of the striking findings of population genetics was uh, that what happens after this major mig- these four migrations were in we know that by around between 2000 bce and 1500 bce all the four migrations are in right the uh, out of africa migrations have been here from 65000 years ago then the west asian uh, iran related population groups have been here from at least 12000 years ago and the east asians have been here at least from 4000 years ago and the central asian uh, had arrived by so all four groups were in between 2000 bc and 1500 bc then the, what the genetic cells us is that during the next 1000 to 1500 years what happens is a mixing between these population groups of the kind 
that the subcontinent had not seen before or later. And uh, to understand this, you have to realize that this, uh, what a tumultuous period this would have been after all the migrations were in, because there are multiple things happening, all of which are major, like a civilization that had survived in its, the largest civilization of the period falling apart, or in the, in the entire world falling apart, and people moving in search of new ways of life. And at the same time, there is a migration that happened from East Asia, bringing new languages. And, and it doesn't stop there. There are also newer mig new migrations that happened from Central Asia, bringing people uh, who are newly dominant, who know, uh, who are masters of metallurgy, who ride horses, and who also create uh, a newly dominant in Northern India. So this is a period of tremendous change and turn. And this genetic census is also a period which sees dramatic population mixing between all of these four components. And uh, this is why we, we will see, when we say that all, we are all mixed, mixed, and the fact is that today, if you take any population group in the subcontinent, no matter how remote a region uh, they live in, you will find uh, evidence of mixing of, of these four components. And the reason is that this is the la la large period during which this mixing happened. But the stunning thing is, the mixing came to a stop around 100 CE. This also is, is visible from the genetic record. And this, is, and this is not something that you find in any other part of the world. And this is, it goes against intuition, because you can imagine a, a population where, uh, where people who were, there are population groups that had never mixed and suddenly one day they wake up and decide, okay, you know, this makes no sense. Let's, let's, let's not uh, keep separate. Let us mix. That makes sense. But here what we are seeing is that around 100 CE, a population that had been mixing in a major manner stops mixing. And we, we see the practice of endogamy, that is communities marrying within themselves, taking, uh, you know, taking hold. And that has continued for the last nearly 2,000 years. And as we know, this uh, endogamy of practice of people marrying within their own communities is the distinguishing feature of the caste system. So now we have an answer to the question, when did the caste system begin? Which is about 2,000 years ago. And it, but it goes against the earlier assumption or the earlier belief most people had that the caste system began as an immediate consequence of the arrival of the Central Asian pastoralists. We now know that is not true. That by the time the caste system fell in place, a large amount of mixing had already happened that affected almost every population group in the country. So that's why Ambedkar was right in many ways when he said there is no racial difference because mixing had already happened by the time caste system fell in place. So then this this raises the question of then what was the process by which this uh, system fell in place? I do not think we have a fully fleshed out. This requires obviously a lot more research and not just genetic research, but research across multiple fields. But now that we have a genetic timing, an idea of when it happened, that research should be easier. But we can today say that the caste, the falling in place of the caste system was a political development rather than genetic development. It was not a theological development. It has, I mean, it may have been a theology and politics are often Difficult to separate them from uh, from each other, but fundamentally, it has to be seen as a political development that happened around 100 CE, where the idea that a society should be hierarch uh, should be, should uh, an ideal society should be a hierarchy that doesn't mix took hold across uh, a large part of the uh, world, uh, a large part of the uh, subcontinent which went against the, what was the practice until then. I guess by and large, I do believe as to uh, this idea because uh, when we think of this in the sense, uh, let's put up this uh, idea that in the 1970s, very recently, we had this yeah. concept of our common future. So everyone yeah. is looking for a future that has that, that is supposed to be common because at some point of time, you are unifying all the human species under one umbrella uh, statement or a phrase that would be our common future. So I think we can safely come up with the idea of our common history. 
where yeah. deep down inside you are licking everyone with one stem or one idea where everyone is unique and everyone is being unique the same on same lines so yes going about the idea of restricting the mixing yes we can say this sir uh, by the fact that when institutionalization began so when you had these sociological setups like marriage as an institution or let's say uh, the caste is an institution because of course in the current dialogues we see that caste is a mere construct that's how people put it up or probably when you read ambedkar's annihilation of caste you come up with the idea that how caste is something which restricts or controls or it's like it's like the rein on the horse by which you control the speed of the horse or it's something which actually uh, is a factor which would determine how the experiment would go or let's say in the research sense it's a controlled variable if i were to put up that way so caste yep. and yes um, uh, marriage and marriage endogamy specifically has actually played uh, a very key role in the upkeep of let's say misinformed debates about the common heritage or the common history yes very well explained and i think we'll continue this with a last question and then we can open up for q and a session so the last yeah. question from my end would be that we see that uh, there's this ideological uh, view or a perspective about let's say one nation one leader one uh, religion one ideology and with a singular history and this is mainstreaming currently not only in india but i see it uh, as a global phenomena where you have uh, let's say one uh, set of people sweeping in one direction and a lot of polarization happening so uh, i will not of course uh, uh, stick to one particular uh, lines of thinking it's been happening and it's a phenomena which has been upgrading and degrading from times to from uh, time and along so we see here a lot of ideas of let's say a particular community being invader or let's say seeing muslims as invaders in india or let's say a particular caste capturing the whole idea of uh, uh, their uh, superiority over other or, or let's put it in the most simplest manner the idea of let's say us versus them so this idea is gaining a momentum not only in india but in the uh, asian uh, let's say south asian subcontinent by and large so when we see this what's your take about this proposition and how you see this debate going in what line and uh, what what future has it for us to hold in the times to come yes sir it's a very important question and i think that's something that uh, that's very relevant to the times that we live in the question is there has always a 20th century european idea that uh, a nation to be to be called a nation should have one language what should be one race one culture one religion one leader and this is the kind of thinking that led to uh, the rise of the of hitler of mussolini of the world wars in in europe this is one kind of naturalist thinking that caused so much misery in the world through the world wars that almost all of the world turned away from it and junked it nationalism itself got a uh, today through much of the world even today uh, ha- has a bad order about it because of the uh, kind of results that it resulted in it became almost all over the world people took to junk the, the this idea of nationalism and took to what can be called liberal democratic ideas of governing and that nations need not have any of these things to call themselves nations to and to set themselves apart but there was uh, one idea one uh, stream in the indian context which borrowed that idea and has become dominant in recent times that for us to be a nation we should have one language one culture one religion but this is not the understanding but this is this goes against the grain of what we are because at as we have seen the indian the uniqueness of the indian civilization is that we have made a common culture of multiple migrations that happened over tens or thousands and tens of thousands of years ago people with different histories people with different migration histories uh, that have merged together and created a common culture that's unique in its so what to manage such a complex culture you need comfort with diversity of beliefs of languages of cultures of belief systems all that is necessary to go against that and to create a political 
organizational structure that goes against this would be in the end uh, unfruitful and uh, it will not be productive it goes against what we have always been and it will remain to be and this is also why there is opposition to the idea that we are a mixture like all all populations are this is not something spe- special to south asia or to indians all population groups are mixtures all population groups around the world are formed by multiple migrations that happened in the past so to many ideological movements around the world this is a problematic idea and this is not something that they would like they would like to say that there is one unique and singular source that is the source of all all their culture and that, that is the uh, that should remain the dominant one and everything else should be subservient but that's not how we have it the harappan civilization which forms a lot of the unity between us happens happened before two of the major components of the indian population today came in so so we have layers and layers of uh, history and layers of layers of history that makes us more unique more interesting more diverse and uh, more fascinating and i think to try and compress it all it were uh, into something else would be both tragic and unnecessary so that is why we appreciate uh, inclusivity rather than exclusivity if, if we were to you know probably crystallize uh, the whole discussion too so yeah. it was very good having you sir i think we pre- briefly discussed about the book the contemporary debates and you you you've actually uh, moved out of the box you've made us think in lines which we we, we uh, on usual grounds do not so i think we will uh, end the session uh here and now now thank you so much sir okay.